You know what I like? Wrong. Marco Polo, both the aquatic game and the 2015 Netflix original series. I understand that not everybody's gonna like all the content in there, but I'm hard to offend and I really enjoyed the thing. I'm also a history guy, so it's fun to see the way shows like that handle stories that I know at least a little bit about coming in. Well, in one of the episodes of Marco Polo, there's this scene where Genghis Khan, the conqueror of China and great Mongol ruler, is having a falling out with his kid brother. And it's the kind of falling out that's gonna end in bloodshed, it looks like, and his kid brother gathers an army and Genghis Khan rides out with his army. And where you would normally expect in like European warfare to see a great big fight with nothing to be said about it, they instead meet the night before they're set to have this battle in this little yurt in the middle of the Mongolian high plains. So these two military commanders, these two brothers, sit down across from each other over a board game that looks kind of like chess. Eventually they get around to talking about the conflict at hand. And the older brother says, this is my land, I'm in charge, I conquered it, you can't have it. And the little brother says, yeah, but I want it and I'm willing to fight for it and they agree with respect that this fight is going to happen. And as they part ways and walk out of this tent, you know that this is a watershed moment, not only in the history of this family, but in the history of Mongolia as it's being portrayed in this TV show. If you've been paying attention to the narrative in this book of Acts, you can tell that we're moving toward a similar watershed moment here between the followers of Christ and the religious establishment. Right now, there's still kind of one thing and everybody's trying to figure out whether Christianity is going to be the fulfillment and completion of Old Testament Judaism, as described by Jesus in Matthew 5, 17, or if Christianity is going to end up being a completely separate religion that the Jewish leadership will not embrace and persecute. This thing got off to a pretty rocky start between these two parties, but as we come into Acts chapter 7, it's still conceivable that we could imagine a way that they could work the thing out and that these two groups could move forward together, acknowledging the God of Abraham and Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, who would bring about the promised kingdom that they were theoretically all looking forward to. Whether he wanted to be there or not, as we come into Acts chapter 7, Stephen is standing in front of the Sanhedrin with an opportunity to explain himself. Based on how tense things are, it feels in the rhythm of the narrative like this is going to be the moment where they're either going to pull this thing together or it's going to completely fly apart. Now, we're going to get to the response to everything Stephen has to say in the next episode. But first, I want to look at this enormous speech that Stephen gives. It's a huge amount of text, like, like that much. So I can see how somebody might wonder, you know, what's the point of having Stephen have a conversation with these guys? Won't they certainly respond the same way? I mean, they've already talked with Peter. They've already talked with John. They've already seen a bunch of miracles and stuff. Like, they know the drill. They've rejected it. But Stephen was a Grecian Jew, so he's coming at this thing from a little bit of a different angle. He's going to employ slightly different language. And culturally, it might just be a, a different touch, a different voice. And so the original audience would have been very curious to see how these leaders will respond to this new voice coming at it from a slightly different angle. The pregnant question for the people reading this in the first century would have been, can Stephen get through to these religious leaders in ways that the others haven't to avert catastrophe? Okay, we're going to be in Acts chapter 7, verses 1 through, I kid you not, 53. Now, normally I try to make it sound like it's all optional if you want to read this thing or not read the thing or just let me read it to you. This would be one of those where I would really suggest taking a minute and reading through the whole thing yourself. It's going to make a lot more sense than me breaking it up. So pause, read, and we'll get going in just a second. The scene is this. Stephen is in front of what is the equivalent of the Supreme Court of the day. He's been called in there not for violence or any other type of legitimate crime. He's been dragged in there simply because he thinks the wrong things, says the wrong things, and represents the wrong things. But like any good dissident who's being charged with thought crimes, he embraces the arrest and embraces the stage as an opportunity to communicate his point to the most important audience he might ever have a chance to communicate it to. But Stephen didn't come all this way to back down or make nice. First and foremost, he's going to seize the opportunity to say what needs to be said. So this is going to get uncomfortable quickly because Stephen is going to level serious charges against them in responses to the charges they've thrown out against the followers of Christ. So to review, Stephen is charged with blaspheming Moses, blaspheming God, and saying threatening things against the temple. 
as we go through this thing, I want you to keep an eye out for the accusations that Stephen is going to level back at his audience. He's going to shoot back saying, first of all, you guys, just like your predecessors, reject the leaders that God raises up to accomplish his purposes. And secondly, he's going to fire back saying that you misunderstand the point of the temple as God has put it together anyway. A big picture look at the whole thing all at once makes it pretty clear that Stephen's goal is to demonstrate the continuity between Old Testament Judaism and Christianity and to call his hearers to repentance. You guys used to think this stuff about Jesus and you used to be getting it wrong. Just stop and instead start identifying Jesus as the Messiah and get it right. Stephen is going to divide his speech up into three parts to illustrate these points. He might have had more that he wanted to say and got interrupted or maybe this was the design of his whole speech. But whatever the case, I think you'll see that there's a pretty clear structure to this. So I'm going to start in verse 1 and read for a while here. Verse 1. Then the high priest asked him, Are these charges true? To this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I'll show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to the land where you're now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even a foot of ground, but God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. God spoke to him in this way, Your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I'll punish the nation they serve as slaves, God said, and afterward they'll come out of that country and worship me in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision, and Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him eight days after his birth. Later, Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob became the father of the twelve patriarchs. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. So he gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So he made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. Well, then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering, and our fathers couldn't find food. So when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. After this, Joseph sent for his father and Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all. Then Jacob went down to Egypt, where he and our fathers died. Their bodies were brought back to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham had bought from the sons of Hamor at Shechem for a certain sum of money. As the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt greatly increased. Then another king, who knew nothing about Joseph, became ruler of Egypt. He dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers by forcing them to throw out their newborn babies so that they would die. I love history and I would love to break all of this stuff down and give you all of the stories that connect with these things, but I'm going to have to let you look that up on your own. Just like I mentioned last time, if you want the quick version of this story, I cover it in episode one of this series, the introduction to the book of Acts. In the meantime, moving forward, what we've got is just basically your rich, thick, creamy Old Testament history. Everybody in the room would have known absolutely every detail that Stephen was throwing out here. They would have remembered and agreed that the patriarchs didn't have the best run early on and that Abraham was made a certain promise and that early leaders of their own people resisted God's promise and God's work and that God was patient with them and brought about redemption anyway. So in the first third of this speech, Stephen doesn't break any new ground with these guys. He just gives a summary they would recognize and demonstrates a pattern that they would all have to agree on. God gave Abraham a promise that was important and good. Your forefathers rejected it and resisted it. God went ahead and did the good thing anyway. The second third of Stephen's speech deals with Moses and picks up in verse 20. It goes like this. At that time, Moses was born and he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for in his father's house. When he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his fellow Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian. So he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they didn't. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, Men, you're brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. When he saw this, he was amazed at the sight. As he went over to look more closely, he heard the Lord's voice. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and didn't dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off your sandals. The place where you're standing is holy ground. I've indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I've heard their groaning and have come down to set them free. 
Now come, I'll send you back to Egypt. Now this is the same Moses whom they'd rejected with the words, Who made you ruler and judge? He was sent to be their ruler and delivered by God himself through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He led them out of Egypt and did wonders and miraculous signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and for 40 years in the desert. This is that Moses who told the Israelites, God will send you a prophet like me from among your own people. He was in the same assembly in the desert with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, and he received living words to pass on to us. But our fathers refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. That was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf. They brought sacrifices to it and had a celebration in honor of what their hands had made. But God turned away and gave them over to the worship of the heavenly bodies. This agrees with what's written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the desert, O house of Israel? You've lifted up the shrine of Molech and the star of your god Rephon, the idols you made to worship. Therefore, I'll send you into exile beyond Babylon. Okay, that's a ton of stuff. And I know that's a ton of stuff. And again, like I said about the first third, some of this might not be familiar to you. And you can go and look up more of this. Would love to talk more about it. But I'll tell you who it was familiar to. It was intimately familiar to everybody Stephen was talking to in this room. In fact, I'm guessing that by this point, there was maybe even a little bit of eye rolling going on. Like, okay, man, seriously. This is material with which we are very, very familiar. This would be like me going in before our Supreme Court to speak to them about something maybe I was accused of thinking that was wrong and starting off by saying, many years ago, our ancestors came to America on the Mayflower. They suffered great hardship and for many winters they labored and labored. And as they did so, they were joined by other brave pioneers seeking fortune in the new world. And eventually we came to a situation where, I mean, oh, come on, we get it. Get to the now and you're three, four hundred years to go. This is going to take forever. So on the one hand, I'm guessing the original audience here, uh, that is the people in the room, were saying, come on, Stephen, cut to the chase. The most attentive listeners in the room would have been starting to sniff out that Stephen was selectively pointing to moments in their history that demonstrated a tendency amongst these people to push back on the plans of their own deity while simultaneously worshiping their own deity. If I were standing before the Supreme Court right now making an argument about something that involved civil rights or inequality between uh, blacks and whites in America, I might give them a history lesson that would include some anecdotes about the colonial slave trade and about the Three-Fifths Compromise and about the Missouri Compromise and about the Dred Scott decision and about the Civil War and about the Ku Klux Klan in the early part of the 20th century, and about the civil rights movement, and about issues that have existed and persisted even since the time of Martin Luther King Jr. And in doing this, I would be developing a track record to say, look, I know that we all say that we want to be on the side of what is right, but let's admit it's kind of in our DNA to have some issues in terms of racial decency as it pertains to non-European members of American culture. That's exactly what Stephen is doing. He's establishing a track record. And in this situation, the track record demonstrates the exact same thing. God made a promise that was good and important to Moses. The people who were supposed to respond to such things resisted and rejected God's work through Moses. And then God went right ahead and did the good and redemptive thing anyway. Same pattern as Abraham. Stephen is going to drive home his point here in part three of his speech, and he's going to follow through on some ideas that he introduced at the tail end of part two as he was dealing with the material with Moses. Picking it up in verse 44. Our forefathers had the tabernacle of the testimony with them in the desert. It had been made as God directed Moses according to the pattern he'd seen. Having received the tabernacle, our fathers under Joshua brought it with them when they took the land from the nations God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David, who enjoyed God's favor and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by men, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. You are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers didn't persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you've betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. Even though we're not going to get to it right now, I'm sure you can guess how that last part went over. What Stephen seems to be doing in this final portion is driving home some ideas he introduced when talking about Moses. 
Moses said that there would be this prophet who would lead them from among their own people. In other words, Moses pointed to the Messiah. God also promised Abraham that he would be this blessing to all the nations and that redemption would come through his line. So the Messiah was also promised to Abraham. And now we get to hear and these people, they're traveling around in the desert and they're bringing God's house with them. And they've got God right there, almost dwelling among them, living in that tabernacle and traveling with them. And then eventually this temple gets built. And so they kind of have an idea of it, but they're missing the point. It's not that God is just with them in that building, but God was going to be with them in the flesh. Abraham and Moses pointed toward it. And Stephen drives home his point here at the end saying, God was here and present and incarnate in a way that is far more complete than what you've experienced in the past with the tabernacle and the temple, and you killed him. So it's kind of weird and hypocritical that you're all upset with me and us because of imagined threats we've made against the temple when you guys actually murdered God when he showed up and tried to dwell among us. What Stephen seems to be saying is that likewise now, God has made good and important promises to you. He's even fulfilled those promises in the person of Christ. But just like your forefathers and in keeping with the pattern, you resisted it and you rejected it. You want God to do his good and redeeming work. You stood on the other side of it. But just as was the case with Abraham and with Moses and the people who resisted God's work that he was trying to do through them, and God went ahead and did the good things he was going to do anyway in spite of your resistance. This is a lot of material, so I'm going to try to make my observations somewhat quick. First of all, I could see how someone reading this in this day and age would look at this whole thing and say, I don't get that speech. I just don't see it. I mean, he had all these chances to make these really good and compelling points. And for me, it just wasn't very convincing. Well, the thing to remember when you read this is this speech wasn't directed at you. This really wasn't meant for you. This really isn't meant to convince most of the audience that I'm talking to here and that would be reading this in 2015. This was directed at a specific subculture, a specific set of assumptions at a very specific time. And for them, the speech was great. He was absolutely speaking their language. There's loaded language in here that everybody he was talking to would have picked up on. In the same way that you have a smell test and uh, whether you're more on the liberal side of things or the conservative side of things or the completely other libertarian side of things, you kind of learn to detect what people are driving at with their language when it's a little bit loaded. If you're in Boulder, Colorado, and you wish someone a Merry Christmas as you swipe your credit card and buy something from their little shop, and they respond to your Merry Christmas with, and Happy Holidays and a Merry Saturnalia to you too. Like, you know what they meant. What they meant was, your Merry Christmas greeting was paternalistic and forcing your religion on me, and I'm offended by that, and your language should be more inclusive when you try to wish people glad tidings. I mean, both parties theoretically on paper said something nice to each other, but you kind of get where both parties are coming from because you know that little cultural debate that we're having right now. 2,000 years from now, if somebody came back and read the transcript of that exchange that I just described, it's not going to mean anything to them without, well, a ton of work to understand those little nuances. Likewise, in order to get this, you got to understand that these little nuances about the relationship between God and his chosen people that Stephen keeps hitting on would have been not little nuances to this audience. They would have caught all of it. And it would have made them feel crappy because it shows them at their worst moments and rather than lumping in this new generation of leaders with the best and most heroic moments of Jewish history, they're being lumped in with the worst, most embarrassing moments in Jewish history. Another observation, how about Stephen standing in and making these remarks? You ever done the thing where somebody says something and they're kind of ganging up on you, maybe with some friends and being rude and you know there's something smart that you need to say that would show them that they're wrong? And you just can't think of it. And so you sort of sit there and bumble and then you go out and you get in the car and you're just like, ah, I'm an idiot. If I would have said this or this or this, I would have showed them up. I would have won that argument. And I wouldn't have come off so bad. We do that all the time. It's really difficult to keep a clear head when a whole bunch of people who don't like you and want you to fail are surrounding you and just waiting for you to screw up. We say dumber stuff in that environment unless we got ice in our veins. And this guy had ice in his veins. There's a reason that he's a hero of the faith. Stephen really earned that saint title that he still wears to this day. 
A third observation, Stephen knew his stuff and it really helped him here. Now we know that Jesus said that the spirit would kind of show them what needed to be said when they needed to say it. So God deserves credit here as well. But good job, Stephen, for just having a grasp of all of this and doing a good job of getting out of the little nuances and jabs and bumper sticker meme level critiques that get thrown out that really aren't nuanced at all. And instead, bringing them back to the big picture to say, look, just think about this thing. Think about the big picture of what God has been doing and where we fit into this and the mistakes we've made in responding to this in the past. And guys, let's just get it right this time. Let's just ditch the stubbornness. Let's just acknowledge that we screwed some stuff up and let's go the redemption route. It's still available. I mean, his language sounds really harsh, but that's what he's going for. He's seeking redemption here. He's trying to push them toward a sensible repentance. But he puts himself in a position to do so by being sharp and knowing his stuff. Am I saying that every single person ever who wants to be a Christian or talk about the Bible needs to memorize all of the Bible and go to 17 years of seminary and win all the Bible trivia games when we no doubt play those at all of our festive holiday Bible trivia events? No, I'm not saying any of that whatsoever. I'm just saying getting the big picture and having a basic gist of what we're talking about with this puts us in a better position to sound coherent and present the things on the terms that God has laid out. A fourth theme is that this continuity from the Old Testament to the New Testament is present. It comes up in just about every passage we look at, it seems like, in the book of Acts. I think Stephen nailed it again. Jesus talks about this stuff. Peter talks about this stuff. Luke highlights this stuff. We're supposed to figure out that there is no break here, that the God of the Old Testament, the God of Abraham and, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are not rivals all trying to win the hearts and minds of different people in this religion. They are one God. They're a triune God functioning together, playing slightly different roles at slightly different moments to bring about this redemption and to bring glory to God. That's what we're going for. That's what's happening here. We're not doing something new. This is God completing what he's already been working on. Fifth, as I mentioned at the beginning, when I talked about Genghis Khan and his brother having the conversation in their yurt, this is a watershed moment. What happens next is going to decide a whole bunch about the future of the relationship between these two parties. But as I talk about this watershed moment and the breaking of fellowship that's about to become pretty permanent between these two groups, I want to make it abundantly clear that I am talking about a Jewish leadership in the first century. This is not something that is intended to be or needs to be uh, an ongoing rivalry between Jews and Christians. This is not an ethnic issue where the Bible is teaching that Jews are bad and non-Jews are good because everybody we're talking about so far in the story are Jews. They're all Jews. We don't get to any non-Jews until quite a ways down the road. God loves these people, loved them then, loves them still as much as he loves everybody else. Uh, some would even argue, hey, there's chosen people. They have a special place in his heart. Instead, what we're seeing here is a theological issue where one party represents self-righteous hard-heartedness in the face of a God who is trying to get them to admit their need and respond to his offer of grace, and the other party represents a flawed but honest attempt to represent the words of Christ to call other people toward that grace. This is a theological issue that we see playing out with this friction, not an ethnic issue. And a final observation from what Stephen says that applies to anybody who reads this, even if we're from a very different cultural context, and that is this. Everyone is called to respond to this thing. Everyone is given this crack at the grace of God. Everyone is provided with the opportunity to have the human problem, the pain, the suffering, the disappointment, the heartache that comes with living in a fallen world and contributing to the fallenness of this fallen world, redeemed and dealt with. God is gracious. God is forgiving. That's the whole point of the plot of the Bible is that you've got this being who's super powerful, but also has this tender, loving heart and compassion. And even though he has every right to judge, he sets that aside and bends over backwards to go through these creative paces to provide opportunity for the object of his love to be redeemed. And, and that's us. He's glorified in the process. He's concerned greatly with his glory. But he loves people, and he loves redeeming. And this opportunity that was being presented to the Jewish leadership at this moment is still being presented to every one of us today. Not everybody will respond to it exactly the same way. Not all those who say, I'm in, will say, I'm in with the same words. Not everybody will practice 
what it looks like to live a life of responsiveness to Christ the same way. And I just don't feel like that's really mine to sort out right now. But what I am sure of from texts like this and others around it is that this is still on the table. God calls us to respond to his offer of grace and forgiveness and to know him and to acknowledge him as Messiah and Savior. And it doesn't matter if that's something that we're into or we're not into. The reality is that's what the text says. And what the text says is, in my imperfect way, what I'm trying to communicate. We haven't even started editing this thing yet, but I'm pretty sure just glancing over here at the timer on my microphone that we're going to be somewhere in the nine hour range for this episode. So thank you uh, for your patience and your willingness to hang with me on this whole thing. I know it was a lot to take in. I want to say thanks for watching this episode, but also thanks for watching all of this stuff. I know a lot of you have marathoned this thing recently to kind of catch up. I appreciate that. I've also had some people that I've been connecting with lately, and it's been really fun to have these conversations and to get to know more people who are a part of the show right now. So thanks for being around. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so, and we'll get on to the next part in uh, about seven days. Thanks so much. See you soon.